Welcome to Kuvulu, the sorcery of copper. Today I will talk about this. This is the infrared cock grenade. For a bachelor's party of a friend, we decided to go and play laser tag, and we wanted to give him the ultimate weapon. Um, first we thought about a holy grenade, but then we decided because of his dirty talk to make it a cock grenade. It's pretty simple. You press on the button here to start it, and after 5 seconds you see these LED blink. These are infrared LEDs, so you can see it on the camera, but in real life you won't see it with the naked eye. And they send a certain code which kills all the players which are in the neighborhood, and that's why it's a grenade. And we'll study how, how, how it works and how I made it. To be able to build this infrared grenade, I needed to find out which signal I had to send using the infrared LEDs. And for that, we need to know what the technology is and which is the one which is used by laser tag weapons. Actually, it's not weapons. They are, these are called taggers. And they don't have to look as real as real weapon replica. So in airsoft, generally you like when it rules, when it's a very similar replica to the real weapon. Here it's not really important and you can find any kind of shape and toys and so on. But as the name says, laser tag, this is a bit misleading because they don't use lasers. Lasers are far too expensive for such equipment. They are not easy to drive and they consume a lot of power. Instead, they use infrared, so infrared LEDs, and this is what also I used. Uh, LEDs are very inexpensive, they are very easy to drive, and they don't consume a lot of power. They are very efficient. So how it happens is that here you have an infrared LED and on the front you have a small plastic optic which narrow the beams. So just a small focus in the end gets the infrared signal. And on the other way, I can build a grenade with very wide angle LEDs so I can cover a larger area than normal taggers have. But let's find out information about how this work. This is the taggers which they use as this place in Berlin, which we went, um, HT11, and we already know it's from a company called Hightech. Very original name. So if we look in the downloads, we try to find some kind of documentation about this product and how they work, what the technology is behind. This is the manual. And if you search for protocol, you won't find anything. Same thing if you search for system. It's really just a manual, so it doesn't give you a lot of information. But we know the company is called Hightech and the product are HG9, HG11 and so on. So let's just look for it. Hightech taggers. And here we find the website from the manufacturer. As you can see, it's not very professional. Uh, even the layout is broken. Here the text is flowing away. Here it's not currently put it. Here the taggers have been taken in a uh, green screen, but then they didn't change. They didn't change it. They just leave it as it is. So yeah, doesn't look very professional, but at least they make it. Here are the taggers again, uh, details, and then in how to. So this category, I don't know what it's called, how to. Like it's, it's, yeah, it's probably the manuals, but you should call it support or something like that, and not how tos. And to show how unprofessional it is, let's have a look at this manual. And when you click a manual, you expect some kind of PDFs, and they give you a Word document. This is completely ridiculous. And if you look at it, it's just a text file with four links. No description, no title, nothing. Just four links to YouTube videos. Why not directly embed it? Uh, I don't really know. So if you're serious, I think in this market you can make a lot of profit if you're more serious than this. This is the manual which they provide and it seems already quite interesting. High-tech operation manual. 
So if it's operation or service manual, that's a, a good lead. Then we have a firmware version. If they talk about firmware, firmwares, they will probably talk about the technology. So again, let's look for protocol, find, and here we can see um, World of Wonders refers to a very simple infrared signal used in all the laser tag. Latest miles tag operating, operating system does not support the WoW protocol. So the operating system is miles tag. This is quite some good information. If we look again here. Mm, miles tag, up oh, there's an S. Miles tag protocol. We find two quite good links. Here we have a, even a C implementation. When it comes to protocol and specifications, I really prefer PDFs. This shows that it been somehow specified the right way and somebody put some, some thoughts into it. It doesn't always have to be this way, but specifications are generally in, done in PDFs. And this gives you already an infrared protocol homer. This is actually the same than the first link we found. The first link also shows exactly the information which we find and describes the protocol. But let's have a look at the PDF. So the infrared, the Milestack 2 protocol, that's the latest, is based on, is modulated on, onto a pulse width modulation waveform. This is when you switch on and off the LED quite fast at a certain frequency. And this frequency is here, this PVM frequency 33 to 56 kilohertz. And then half of the time the, infra, the LED is on and the other half it's off. And this blinking of on off happens at this frequency. And for to do that, you use pulse width modulation. It's pretty common. I didn't play with infrared previously, so I also learned everything about infrared um, signal transmission for this project. And this is how it works. So you switch on the LED, so the PVM signal here, and for 2400 microseconds, you just leave it on and pulsing at this frequency. Then you switch it off for 300 microseconds, and if you want to send zero, you just switch it on for 600 microseconds and then switch off for 600 microseconds. Or you switch it on for 1200 microseconds and then off for 600 seconds. So this is the space and this will send a one. So we have a header and then the bits are either 600 or 1200 microseconds and you have a space between all of them. And this is pretty common in infrared. Um, signals. So there are lots of protocols and the remote which you used for your TV also uses a specific infrared encoding and protocol. There are tons of them. And this one is actually quite quite well specified. So we know how to transmit zeros and ones. Now we have to transmit the data itself. Here's the data protocol. This describes you how shot packet works, how the message packet works with all the information you need. And then you have special commands. So these are the command packets. If you look at one, this one, this is the one, uh, the one I used. Explode player. So I just had to send this information out and this causes a grenade to, to be triggered. Causes an explosion sound effect to be played to uh, to be played and set the health to zero. So this is really the effect of the of of the grenade. So we know the protocol. Uh, we know how to send bits. We know which data we have to send for for the grenade action. And the last information we need is at which frequency it operates, since it can op it can operate at the signal can be modulated at different frequencies. For that, we look again at the manual and we look for frequency here. Infrared carrier frequency, this is 56 kilohertz. And with that, we have all the information we need to implement and to create our grenades. Before I came with this last design, 
I wanted to prototype it and for that I used this development board. It's not really a development board, it's a hardware badge which I got from a security computer security conference called Troopers, which happens in Heidelberg in Germany. And what this is, is simply a customization of this. This is the TVB gun from Mitch Altman, so it's pretty simple. You just put the batteries inside, you press on the button, and then this high power infrared LEDs will send lots of TV codes to switch all TVs off. This is why it's called TVB gone. So you just press on it and then all the codes are stored in here and it will go through all the codes and try to switch off all the TVs. And with that we there's actually everything I need. I needed a microcontroller which I could program, I needed um, LEDs and I needed one button. But I didn't have this TVB gone in the beginning, I only had this hardware badge. And But it's the same thing, it's just a, a different layout. Here's the microcontroller, here's the um, clock, to have a, here's the crystal to have a very precise clock. Here are the LEDs, we have six of them instead of having just four of them. Here's just LED to, to blink, here's the button. And on the back you again have the three batteries and what I did is I soldered this programming header. So this uses an Atmel 80Tiny85 and on the back this is the in-circuit, in-system programming header for programming Atmel's devices. There was even a serial out, I even used a serial output and this is why I have this UART to USB converter so I can debug it. I had two ways to debug it, the serial output and this LED blinking here. And with that I just programmed on the raw chip the code itself. Um, the, these Atmel microcontrollers and almost all microcontrollers support generating PVM signal. It's one of the timer options. So you simply program the timer in a PVM mode, you set the frequency at which it operates, and then you say just one pin toggle every time to generate this signal. So it, this is the first transistor which then controls all these six transistors. And these six transistors will control if power goes through the LEDs or not. The small microcontroller here cannot provide enough power for all these LEDs. I think each LED is 100 milliampere, so we have 600 milliampere, and the output current of this microchip, of this chip, is I think rated at 40 microamp. And this is why we have all these transistors to control everything and resistors are just for protection. So with that I implemented the grenade using high power LEDs but I needed to find out if it's really the right signal which is sent. So I used this one for that. This is the USB infrared toy from Dangerous Prototypes but really I cannot recommend it. Um, it's simply a PIC microcontroller with USB and it, it comes with pre-programmed firmware which helps you developing with infrared. So you can send codes, I didn't need it, I just needed to receive codes. Normally it comes with this receiver, that's a TSOP38 something, and it only receives signal which are modulated at 38 kilohertz. You don't want to implement this detecting of the modulated signal into into bits themselves. So you use these uh, transceivers. They detect when the, mod the signal is modulated at 38 kilohertz and then they will just tell you on or off. And this is exactly what we require. So I removed the one for 38 kilohertz and I put one at the TSOP 56 something which operates at 56 kilohertz because this is the frequency used for the taggers and then the firmware itself in here which can give you code. Um, 
I filed four bugs because I had to use different firmwares for different features and it didn't work quite well. I spent a lot of time and I cannot recommend it. It's pretty simple actually. You should, you should, I should have taken just a receiver and put it somewhere on a free pin and then just read out the information myself because this demodulator really says you zero or one. So it's pretty easy. <laughs> but I will give it, I will still give the program and Using that, I just receive the signal. It sends me the data out over USB, so that's pretty useful. And then I, I implemented a program which measured the times in which it was on and off, and then told me which packet is sent. And this way, I was able to, on this part, send the format, send the signal for the grenade using the format I program, and to verify it using a second implementation using this tool. And that was the development. And after the development, I made this board and we will have a look at this board. It's pretty simple, but I'll still show how it works. So this is the schematic of the board which I produced for the infrared cock grenade. It's pretty simple. On the sensor, here we have the microcontroller, 80 tiny 45. It's a very small microcontroller, but it's sufficient for the task. I don't need a lot of pins. On the top with the battery, three times AAA that provides 4.5 volts, around 4.5 volts, and we can connect it directly to the chip because this one easily operates between 3.3 and 5 volts. Here we have UART for debugging. Here we have the ISP in system programming port so we can program this chip itself this is the button to trigger the, um, the grenade so then it will explode here there is a small led to indicate that the grenade is activated and that you have five five seconds to send it this is a very precise clock at eight megahertz because we want to pulse the infrared at a precise frequency but Actually, I don't think that this is required. Um, uh, probably it also works quite well without this and you can generate this frequency of 40, 56 kilohertz quite accurate enough without clock. But it's here, so it precise more clock. And this, what you see here, this is normally a linear dropout voltage regulator, but this is the adjustable version. And this is particular because I can now, I can directly connect it to the battery on this side, but on the other side, it's not a fixed voltage. I used a fixed current. And this is what you see, this resistor here. This resistor will define which current will flow through here. And I've used fixed current because this is how I want to drive the LEDs here. So we have two times two LEDs. There are two in rows in series because each of them uses around 1.8 volts. So the two of them will use 3.6 volts. And because my battery source is three AAA batteries, I, I can provide power for this, but not for all faults in series. Generally, you want to, pro to put as many LEDs as in series as you can, because if you have a constant current, the current which will go across the LEDs will be the same for each of them. So they will have the same brightness. For example, here they are two in parallel. If this one was slightly different, the voltage would be, um, the voltage on, in this path would be higher or lower on the voltage at this path. And it can happen that these two paths are not as bright. But yeah. For, for this application, it was good enough. I had the voltage to the LEDs from the same series. And I mean, it's not really critical to be that, that precise. Uh, the grenade will be thrown somewhere away and, uh, but, and, and then just blink. But in theory, try to keep them in series if you can and provide a constant current. And this resistor here will define which will be the constant current which will go through the LEDs. The microcontroller just connects uh, controls if they're on and off. And here there will be the PVM signal, which is coming out of this pin. 
and this will switch on and off this PMOS, which will provide power or not to this, and this will modulate the signal and send the miles tag grenade data command. And yes, here the resistor is less than 120 ohm. 120 ohm will provide 100 milliampere to this. This is far too bright. 100 milliampere means it will uh, kill everyone within 10 to 20 meters if you use this grenade in a room. If you want, if you have a grenade, you want that it that it kills everyone in five meters or 10 meters, but you don't want to be all the players in the whole room and also far away to, to get killed. And this is why you need to choose a resistor which is less than 120 ohm. And this fine tuning on which resistor you use, you can either use a trim pot, also a potentiometer, or you just put a fixed value once you test it yourself. And this is just practical information. So you can put a low value if you want to have it for indoors and a high value if you want to have it outdoors. Now that we've seen the schematic, let's have a look at the board itself. So here's the, here's the board. Yep, let's open it and see what's inside. This is the back to protect it. So this plastic thing, the cock, comes actually from a vacuum pump. So generally you put your penis here and then you have here a small hole where you can we have a small pump and then you can vacuum it. But we found it pretty useful because it has a lot of space. It's in form of a cock, which is pretty fitting for him. And it's quite hard plastic. And it's transparent. So the infrared can go out. Although we didn't need it, it was, if we could have put the in, uh, LEDs inside and then uh, used the transparent plastic to have it outside. But we put it on the outside because it, it looks also nice and it works better. So these are the four infrared LEDs, which you saw. This is the indicating LED, this is the button, and this is already two years old and it still works. I didn't change the battery since then. So that's that's pretty good. I didn't expect it to, to last so long. And this is the board. Quite a lot of cable. Tuck, 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 tuck. Let's disconnect the cables. I have to remember what is where, but it's not really important actually. Um, to produce this board, I used a CNC milling machine, the LPKF Protomat S63, and you just put a bare, cup, bare plate of copper and you define where you want the CNC bits to mill out this path. So you can insulate the traces and using that you can prototype PCBs. And for fast prototyping, it's quite useful. Uh, as you can see, I also did some mistake. <laughs> Normally you put the through hole components on the other side, on the front, and then the traces on the back and the surface mount on the back. Here I forgot to put the through hole components um, on the front. And this is why the microcontroller is on the back. These ones can still be on the front because they only have two pins. So it's not really important which side they are since you can reverse them, so since you can mirror them. So this is the um, ISP programming header. This is serial. I think this is the voltage. Yes, exactly. This is the input voltage. Here we have the Atmel RT-Tiny 45 microcontroller. Here we have the first transistor which controls all the other transistors. Actually, I only have, ah, yeah, this is the PMOS. This is the PMOS transistor which will power on and off all LEDs. And this is, this is where you connect the LEDs. So we have six ports. I only use four of them. I don't know what the other is. Oh, so four ports for the LEDs, then we have one port for the switch and one other port for this 
for this LED. The last one, probably for serial, I don't remember exactly. But this is a very simple board, you just connect all the cables inside and for prototype it, it worked quite well. <coughs> I'll put the I'll put the schematic online on the wiki and not on the on the git this time, but it's pretty simple. And with that you can already have a lot of fun and with a simple thing like having infrared LEDs blinking, so having infrared LEDs blinking you think infrared is pretty simple and it's a good entry program if you never program microcontrollers. Setting up the timer, it's probably looking at interrupts, putting the microcontroller to sleep so it doesn't draw a lot of energy, using, um, oh now I remember, using um, using PMOS to drive LEDs, high power LEDs, using a voltage regulator to have constant currents and also this last thing which is here is simply for I don't know, can we see it? Here, this one. As you can hear here, there is a resistor. And this last thing was the fixed value resistor to define how bright it should be. So I just put it in a room, changed a couple of resistors, and then measured how wide, how far the signal went. And then you just connect the, the resistor here so you can define which current goes through the LEDs. So with that, the, the project is done and was pretty fun as you can see. Enjoy!